Hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's session. Um, my name is Justine. I'm an M3, um, which is the kind of the short term as saying I'm a third year at Wake Forest School of Medicine. Um, and I want to welcome everybody to tonight's virtual town hall regarding secondary applications. So I know that this year's medical application cycle is already underway. Primaries have probably already been submitted. Um, so this is a very exciting time for applicants, but it can also be very um, anxiety provoking and challenging. Too often applicants receive misinformation from misleading sources. For example, we have the entire internet at our disposal. Um, so this application process is already very long and challenging. And so we want to make sure that you guys can all get accurate and honest information. We don't want this to be a struggle for anybody. So before we begin um, tonight's live stream Q&A session, I do want to just talk briefly about YPI, which is otherwise known as the Young Physicians Initiative. So our organization is composed of motivated medical students um, who are interested in making a career in medicine both more accessible and equitable. So here at YPI's pre-med portal, we achieve this mission by hosting webinars, um, such as these live streams, every few months um, with the help of gracious admissions deans and directors from across the country, um, two of which we are lucky to have tonight with us. And so as the people who make admissions decisions, they'll be helping to filter out the fiction um, and instead provide us with facts and reliable information, which will hopefully um, guide you guys through this process this year or in the future. So in just a second, I'll be introducing our panel um, of med school admissions faculty who will be answering both yours and our questions in the live Q&A. Um, if at any point you have questions for our panelists, um, feel free to post them in the comment section. And here are just a few pointers about the questions. Um, first, the shorter question, the better. Um, the program won't let us display really long questions, so please keep them concise um, and no longer than a couple of sentences. Second, um, if you have more than one question, feel free to chime in multiple times. Um, you can really ask as many things as you would like, uh, pending how many questions we receive. Um, and then lastly, we receive more questions than we can answer, as I just hinted at. Um, so we'll try and select the questions that most viewers can benefit from. That being said, if you have questions that are really specific to your situation um, or application, um, try to consider how you could rephrase them so they could be applicable to more viewers. Um, so just lastly, before we begin, we really appreciate your feedback so that we can better our program and better help you all. Um, so please, at the end, take some time to fill out our very brief survey. There will be a QR code. You can scan it um, and it'll lead you right there. Um, so please, please, um, before you hop off tonight, um, help fill that out so that we can go forward and make some changes. All righty. So now on to our panel. Okay, so first we have Dr. Amy Ahern. Um, she is the Assistant Director of MD Admissions at Carver College of Medicine, um, which is at the University of Iowa. Hi, Justine, thank you so much. I am I just wanna clarify, I'm not a doctor. So you can call me Amy, feel free. Everybody feel free to call me Amy. Um, just happy to be here tonight. As Justine mentioned, I do MD Admissions at the University of Iowa. If you don't know where Iowa is, it's in the Midwest. We're about four hours to the west of Chicago, about five hours south of Minneapolis, about four and a half hours north of Kansas City. So thanks for having me tonight. I appreciate the opportunity. Of course. Thank you for being here with us. Um, in second, um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Scott, Scott Darling. Um, he is the Associate Director of Admissions um, at Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, and that is located at the University of Buffalo. Oops, we can't hear you. Oh, here we go. Okay, is that better? Yes, all set. Okay. I, okay, I was saying, hi, Justine and everybody. Um, thanks for having me. I'm... Um, uh, Scott Darling, I'm a family medicine physician and sports medicine physician here in Buffalo. Um, I'm also the associate uh, director of admissions at the medical school at the University of Buffalo. We call it the Jacobs School of Medicine. Um, you probably have heard of Buffalo and probably not for the best reasons because we just got inundated with uh, enormous snowstorms this winter. Um, so we were on the news not for probably the best reasons, but 
So we do get a lot of snow here, um, but the summers are beautiful. Um, so if you decide to come to Buffalo, you have all four seasons. But uh, thanks for having me. Of course, thank you for being here. Um, so now that we've kind of introduced both of our um, admissions personnel here tonight, um, we're gonna get started with the Q&A. Um, so the first one question um, is gonna populate at the bottom of the screen here. Okay, so first thing, what are secondary applications or secondaries? Um, let's see, Amy, do you want to give us a go? Sure. So after you fill out your primary application and I'll, I'll back up a little bit. And if I'm covering things in too much detail, I'm sorry, but I just want to make sure nobody's left out, um, and understands the whole process, what I'm talking about. So the first thing you would do is fill out your primary application through AMCAS. And that's going to consist of your personal statement your transcript, all of your grades, your MCAT score when you have it ready, and then the 15 most meaningful experiences that you've been up to, mostly while you've been in college, but for the last five years or so. That's your primary application. You turn all of that in and you get to say, okay, these 10 to 20 schools that I'm interested in, I want them to see my information. So, I say 10 to 20 schools because that's what I advise students to do in terms of their application process. I think if you apply to 30, that's probably too many and too much money. If you apply to fewer than 10, I think you're not spreading your net as far as it probably should be cast. So we surveyed the people that came for their interview at Carver last year and we said, how many schools did you apply to in addition to Carver? And their answer was 18, making Carver the 19th school. And those are students that we interviewed. So as a rule, I usually encourage people to apply to 10 to 20 schools in the process. So you pick your 10 to 20 schools, and then some schools will screen for what's called a secondary application, meaning there's some criteria they're looking for applicants to meet, probably GPA and MCAT requirements. That's what we do. We screen for MCAT and GPA minimums. We want to make sure that anybody we're issuing a secondary application to has a chance of getting through the committee's approval process. Some schools do not screen for secondary applications. They'll send one to anyone who's interested. There's typically a fee associated with the secondary application as well. And the secondary application for Carver is pretty simple. It's five questions, four if you've never applied before. What you spent hours doing for your primary application can probably be completed on our secondary in an hour or two. It's nothing too intense. So I'm sure I left some things out, Justine, but um, that's how I would answer that one. No, that was great. Thank you so much. Dr. Darling, do you have anything to add to that? No, that was a great um that was a great uh, summary, Amy. You know, I, I, some people say, you know, what do I expect on these secondary applications? And um, although schools really can't um, tell you ahead of time what the secondary applications are, as a, as a general rule, you want to think of, um, they're going to ask, why do you want to come to our school? You know, make us feel special that you have done your homework and you're looking into our school. Make sure it's not just a plug and play little uh, essay where you can take one school's name out and put in another school. Um, you know, like for example, for our school uh, at Jacobs uh, School of Medicine in Buffalo, um, there's various things that the med students do that, um, that applicants would want to know about and do their research about ahead of time. So uh, they may include uh, things like our Lighthouse Free Medical Clinic or um, UB Heals, which works with the homeless population. Um, so, so the person who's reading your application and especially your secondaries knows that um, you uh, are really, truly interested in their school and you didn't just check another box to um, apply to another school. Unfortunately, the, the application process takes a long, long time. You have to dedicate hours, like Amy said, and, um, you know, it's worth it to really sit down and write uh, good secondary applications because those are looked at. All right. Those are great points. Thank you. Sean, do you want to put up our next question? All right. Should applicants answer every question, even those that are optional? Um, Dr. Darling, do you want to give this one a go first? I would say so. Yeah. I mean, some questions they do, um, you know, during COVID, we, I can tell you this one because we don't have it anymore. We had a question. We have three um, secondary essays and one of them was 
uh, tell us a way that COVID uh, affected you. And it said optional, but um, the people that omitted that, um, you know, those weren't looked on as favorably as people that answered all three. Um, it was thought of as maybe they just didn't have time or they just didn't put in the effort to it. So, so every uh, optional essay, I would, I would strongly encourage um, everyone to, uh, to do. Amy, does the same thing go for your experience? Yeah, we don't have any optional questions. <laughs> if it's on there, they want an answer. <laughs> and um, the admissions committee certainly doesn't optionally read responses. They read it all. So I would say if there's a question on there, um, I would I would answer it. Yeah, we don't have anything that's optional on our application. So I would say if there's a prompt there, give it a go. Alrighty, sounds good. Thank you both. All right. Next question, please. How quickly should applicants send back their secondary applications? Amy, I'll give this one to you first. Sure, well, there's no pressure. Um, there's no expectation that it's turned in in two days, five days, a week. There's no expectation. Now, having said that, as the process works, and as you know, there are more spots the earlier in the season that things begin. So let me just walk you through what happens if you apply to Carver. So let's say you were one of those people that had your primary turned in the first week it opened in June. You're one of those. And I know there's some on this call tonight. Um, so they had everything turned in. As soon as it opened, well, AMCAS takes a while, about 30 days from what I understand, to verify the information in your application and then they'll turn it over to us. So we start getting the information early July. We screen secondary, we screen for secondaries by hand, meaning there isn't just a computer button that we push in order to issue them. We have people looking at this so that we do not make a mistake with the computer and send a secondary to someone who is not deserving. So the pro all that to say, the process can take two to three weeks for us to issue a secondary application to an applicant, and that's normal. So about two to three weeks, you finally get the secondary. And then, like I said, you could probably have it turned in within a day or two. It's nothing too terribly intense. Um, it's funny to me that we have to send nudge emails every season for people that begin the secondary and then haven't finished it after a month, six weeks, two months, three months, et cetera. So, there isn't an expectation or on our end that it needs to be turned in very quickly. It is helpful for you as the applicant to not be one of those people that waits and gets the nudges and is just like, is this person going to finish or not? Um, so it doesn't help you to wait too terribly long. But again, it's not something that you have to feel an intense pressure to have turned in within 24 hours or something like that. Okay. Um, just kind of going off of that, if you get something such as a nudge, um, would that penalize you in any way? No way. Um, you have to remember, for you going through this process, this is your blood, sweat, tears, and life, right? For very many months. For us, we are processing thousands of applications. So there isn't a way we could remember, oh, yeah, this person took two months, and that really ticked us off. There's just simply, don't don't overthink it. Um, as much as you can avoid doing in this process, that would be in sort of the overthinking camp um, from my perspective. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Darling, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, that was great, Amy. Well said. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think uh, there is no um, there is no official deadline but um, until the end of the cycle, but you really do want to get them in as soon as early as you can. Now, some people admit, um, fill out their application and they're waiting, uh, the initial application, they're waiting for like an MCAT score to come in if they've retaken their MCAT. And that's fine. You know, if you think, you know, my MCAT's kind of low, I should wait until this, this MCAT comes in and then I could submit. Um, that's fine, you know, but typically, like Amy said, the earlier in the cycle, the better. Every single application is looked at, um, and there's a there's a holistic process. So it's it's not only um, 
you know, at least at the University of Buffalo, Buffalo, there's no um, strict cutoffs for anything. You know, we look at the entirety of the applicant. Um, so did you do, did you have a long distance travel? Did you come from a, a poverty? Did you have a lot of hardships growing up? Um, all of that stuff factors in. So as you're, as you're applying, the, really the sooner the better. Um, but if you have a reason to wait, like a, a score is coming in, that's perfectly fine. Uh, and the same thing with the secondaries. You don't want to let those sit around. And, and we send a lot of those same nudge emails um, as uh, Iowa uh, does here. So, um, you know, so and that's one of those things like that we don't remember who we send them to. But um, to have your very best chance, you kind of want to have those applications in as soon as you can. OK, great. Thank you so much. OK, let's go to the next question. Okay. Should applicants repeat information already mentioned um, in the primary application on their secondaries? Dr. Darling, you want to go first? Okay. In the secondaries? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So if you've already stated information, you know, in your primary, maybe it was one of your experiences, X, Y, and Z. Should you restate that information in your secondary? Will the primary be kind of looked at? At no, no, saying. that's that's not a good idea. So, uh -huh. you know, the, app, the the person going over your uh, application with a fine tooth comb has already read that you've gone to Peru and that you've worked on a medical service trip. Um, so you don't need to restate that. That's already been stated. The secondaries are really, um, like I said, so the school uh, knows that um, they that you've done your research on the school and they may ask questions of um, current events, you know, that are, have gone on in the social events, social determinants of health, um, anything like that. So, um, so this is really your chance to shine and make it personal, so that the person reading it, you know, they know that that you've uh, that you've done your homework, and you want to make the person reading it feel like, you know, this school is your school that you really want to apply to, no matter what. So don't repeat things. Um, if you put it um, in your personal statement, that's great. Um, you don't have to repeat it in your secondaries. If you put it as an um, as an experience, again, that's great. But you typically don't uh, repeat that, you know, towards the end of the secondaries either. Okay, great. Amy, would you like to add? Well, ours is just structured a little bit differently. We sort of make you repeat things in ways. Well, let me explain. One of the questions asked on our secondary application is, what activities have you been up to specifically related to healthcare for the last five years? So that for the committee is a snapshot. Of course, they're gonna read your whole 15 most meaningful experiences, but they want a snapshot of what's healthcare related. So in that way, we sort of force applicants to repeat things. Um, and so that's okay for our purposes. Okay, great. Thank you both. Next question, please. Okay. What advice do you have for tackling the most common prompts, such as um, ones that focus on diversity, adversity, et cetera? Dr. Darling, do you want to go? Yeah. I mean, I think when you're, this can apply to, you know, when you're writing about things or when you're actually interviewing in person. Um, you know, speak from the heart. If, if you speak from your heart and, and what you truly feel, um, it'll be easy. So, you know, don't, don't write down something you think that trying to overthink the committee of what they want to, to know would be your best response. Um, you know, at least for uh, University of Buffalo, if you have diversity in, in your background or if you have adversity, um, that only elevates your application. Um, for us, um, you know, we've all heard about the recent um, Supreme Court ruling and have to tweak our admissions process a little bit based on that, as all schools are doing across the country. But that being said, um, there's many other reasons that make an applicant unique. You know, I had a, um, a gentleman that was applying and um, he had been homeless for a short period of time and he described that. And um, that came across easily in his application. So, um, I mean, talk about adversity. I mean, there's there's places on the application to mark um, socioeconomic status or, or how you know you've you've had a, an upbringing that may be 
difficult in a way or um, where you've you've learned to work with diverse populations. And that only, at least for our school, that elevates you, um, you know, as, as far as someone who is uh, adept at treating uh, people from all different walks of life and background, you know, moving forward. Um, so I would say, you know, make sure you highlight that in any way you can, um, because um, it, it, at least for our school, it only works in your favor. Okay, great. Amy, do you have anything you'd like to add? I think Dr. Darling made some really excellent points. And the only, I think the point about, you know, following your heart and your story, that's the most important one that I want you to take away from this. One thing I want to mention in addition to those things that he mentioned that were great is that I want you to talk to somebody about this question. Because so often I'll meet with students and they'll say, well, I don't have any, you know, my parents are still married. I'm white, I'm from a middle class background. Like I, ha I don't have any diversity to offer. I haven't been through anything really challenging in my life. And so I don't, I, I don't have a good answer for this prompt. I am hard pressed to meet anyone who after talking to you for 30 minutes doesn't have a beautiful addition to share with the committee about these kinds of things. So even if it's not clear to you, and it might not be, and that's okay. I want you to talk to people like me or Dr. Darling or your pre-med advisor, or maybe if that feels too scary at the beginning, maybe it's a friend that you trust. Um, but once you start talking with people and explaining more about your motivations for medicine and experiences you've been in your through in your life, I think a lot of things um, come up, bubble up, that might be really good responses to this question. Because again, as Dr. Darling mentioned, there isn't an expected answer. There's not an answer that is better than others. And certainly people have written about things that no one knows on the surface. So don't let this question scare you and definitely talk with people to help you understand what might be the best answer for you. Awesome, I think that's Can great. I just add one thing to that? Go for it. That, that was great, thanks, Christine. You know, I, I, I also want to tell everyone to work with your pre-health or your pre-med advisor. They are an invaluable resource um, that can truly help you. What if, if you don't think you have diversity um, or adversity, go and, and link and do some work with a group that makes you work with people um, from different backgrounds than you. Go, you know, work either in a food pantry, go volunteer at the Red Cross, do something. And, you, and a lot of times pre-health or pre-med advisors have a list of places in the area that you could do this at, or you could scribe at, or you could volunteer at or shadow at. Um, and certainly they can help as you go further along in the application process towards interviewing and practice interviewing and even reading your personal statement if you need uh, somebody to do that. So so they're an invaluable resource. Um, I wouldn't say be afraid of them at all. They're, they're there for you. They're on your side. All right. Thank you for that. I would also just kind of bouncing off of both of what you said. Um, I think something that a lot of pre-meds don't realize is that diversity comes in lots of different forms. It's not just a cookie cutter box. You can have wildlife experiences that make you think a certain way, um, et cetera. So keep that in mind. And then the other thing is that for the people who don't have pre-med advisors or they're kind of MIA, et cetera, um, I think just find a professor that you really trust that you clicked with, um, or like Amy said, a friend that you really trust um, to kind of have those conversations with, to learn more about yourself too. Alrighty, next question, please. Okay, what is one thing unique about your institution that you wanna share with applicants? I'll let Amy go first. Sure, so I think the, the thing that's pretty unique about Carver from what I understand is that we have students in the pre-clinical curriculum, so in the classroom for the first year and a half. And then second semester of your second year, you're fully transitioned into the clinics. So I think that makes Carver a little bit unique. And I think a lot of students, it's a good fit for their learning style. I've yet to meet a student who said, gosh, I just want one more semester in the classroom. 
you know? Um, so I think it's a good fit for lots of types of learners. Um, but I think that would be probably the most unique part of the curriculum. Another facet of the curriculum is that you're 100% combined with our PA students. So our MD and our PA students are in the first year and a half of classes together. And our teachers don't know who's PA or who's MD, and frankly, they don't care. Um, so I think that's a unique perspective of our curriculum. As you well know, uh, medicine is a team sport. So I think it's just great for our MD and students to be with our PA students. Right now, the PA program is, I think, number two in the country. So our PA students are, are making our MD students work even harder, which is great. That's great to hear. All righty, Dr. Darling. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, I guess um, it's interesting to hear what other schools do. Um, I could tell you for the um, University of Buffalo, um, the med students are pretty much on their own. Um, they're, you might be combined with uh, dental students um, or gross anatomy PhD students during the gross anatomy process, uh, the gross anatomy classes. But, um, but typically you're on your own. Um, it's also uh, interesting you know, to hear how other schools, every, every school is different. Um, for the University of Buffalo, we start med students right in clinics, right in semester one. Um, they're paired with a preceptor. And um, I take two students, for example, uh, that are first years. And we know that you don't know anything, you know, you're just kind of learning the process of how to talk to a patient, how to interview them, how to ask questions. Um, but it's an early exposure. Um, so our, our clinical um, exposure starts very early in the first year. Um, and mostly you can think of years one and two as classwork and years three and four um, as um, rotations. Um, but you will get paired with a preceptor uh, in your first first semester. All right, awesome. Thank you both for sharing that. Um, and I'll just give a quick blurb about Wake. Um, you start, you get tossed into the clinic, the hospital, like first week, you have like a little two hour block or something like that, just to say hi to a patient. Um, and let me tell you, I was shaking. <laughs> so it's so funny to see the new cohorts have to go through the same thing. Um, but thank you both. All right, next question. Okay, so it's time to wrap up. Um, what is your biggest takeaway from tonight's session? Um, I can go first. Um, I think the big thing is really just being in tune with the things that you've done in your life that make you unique and then the unique things about a specific institution that drive you to it. Um, make sure you just you know investigate each institution, figure out why you really like it, why are you applying? You're not just clicking the button. Um, because it'll show on the other side. Um, all right, I'm going to switch over to admissions now. Um, Amy, would you like to go first? Sure. So no pressure, just the biggest takeaway. Um, <laughs> I think when we were talking, and, and Justine, I think you and I both mentioned something early in the program that, oh, since you maybe have already applied, um, kind of implying that you should have applied by now if you're in the cycle presently. I definitely want to have my biggest takeaway be take your time. And what I mean by that is if your timeline suggests that you haven't applied by now, it's okay. You have plenty of time still to apply. I want you to take your time because if that means pushing back your MCAT by a week or two and improving your score substantially, that's okay. Take your time, the time that's right for you. Also take your time on the application. What you think may take a month to complete, maybe it really will take three months and that's okay. What you do compared to what your friends are doing or other pre-meds are doing, don't play the comparison game any longer because it will only make you paralyzed and result in frustration for you. Um, if I had a dollar for everyone who goes online and looks at bad information online about this process, student doctor network, you know who you are, if you are in it, um, I could stop working, I would have so much money, I would have piles of money. Um, and so I encourage you to really take your time and just focus on that. Stop comparing the application or what you've done or what you haven't done to other people in the process. 
I love that. I'm going to use that still right now in med school. Stop comparing myself. <laughs> it's the thing to take with you for the rest of your life. Um, okay, Dr. Darling, would you like to chime in? Sure. Yeah, I know. One big, one big takeaway. And this is a tough one. Um, I, you know, my, my advice is always um, do, if you're, if you're looking for experiences, do the ones that you like to do. Again, don't do it to check a box. If you say, well, I'm dermatology, I might be interested in that. Go scribe at a dermatology clinic. Um, you know, the, that will come through on your application that you have done this be because this is what you want to do. And, and you really have to convince yourself that, you know, MD school is, is what you want to do for the rest of your life and not PhD or teacher or another profession, any other of the great professions that um, you could do. So, so like Amy said, take your time. And when you're picking your experiences, um, you should do things that you like. Um, same thing with your undergraduate major. Make it, make it something that you like. Don't just do one major because it checks the boxes for pre-med and that's it. Um, you know, do something that you like. So, you know, in applying to med school, in these experiences, you should um, make sure that you have some kind of clinical work. Um, if all of your work is research and you have no shadowing and you have no scribing, then the person reviewing your application and talking to you um, an interview is going to say, do you really want to do medical school or do you want to do something else? So, you know, use this time to take your time, like Amy said, and if you need to take a gap year or two or three, that's fine. A lot of people do that. You know, don't pressure yourself into going right into med school if you need a little more time. Um, so, yeah, I guess that would be my biggest takeaway is, is clinical experience in something that you like to do. Awesome. Thank you. And I can just add to that. I took two gap years. And if I asked around my class, I think actually the minority of people probably went straight through. So there doesn't need to be that added pressure. So thank you both so much um, for all of your help tonight, really. Um, so uh, kind of as we're closing right now, there is a tiny little, I don't even know what corner it's in. Maybe we're there, <laughs> there is a QR code for everyone to scan. It's also going to come up again at the end just to give us some feedback. Um, but really, I want to say thank you to both of our panelists tonight. Um, we really appreciate both their participation and attendance. Um, we couldn't do this without them. And then I also want to give a big thank you to everybody who's watching um, and those who are watching um, in the future. And lastly, I need to give a huge thank you um, to our YPI pre-med portal team. Um, we could not be here right now talking um, without the help from the entire team to organize tonight's event. And a huge thank you to Dr. Aval Kelly, who's kind of the man behind all of YPI. Um, he also um, helped provide us with the streaming platform. And so kind of to all of our viewers tonight, uh, please share this information and this live stream uh, with your peers, institutions. Um, feel free to get it out there because we really don't want any of your peers getting misinformation such as Student Doctor Network. <laughs> um, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. We also have a website um, where our newer panels um, will be uploaded very soon. Um, so you can also watch previous ones as well. So thank you again to everybody. Um, good night and good luck. Goodbye. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.